Hello, my name is Dr. Bonnie Key, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Jack Cardio Oncology. Today, I am joined by Dr. Carmen Burgum. She's an Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology, and Dr. Josh Mitchell, an Assistant Professor of Cardiology, both of whom are faculty in the School of Medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Burgum and Dr. Mitchell are the lead first authors of two state-of-the-art reviews that are featured in our September 2021 Jack Cardio Oncology mini focus issue on radiation and cardiovascular disease. We are here today together to discuss these seminal reviews on radiation therapy. First, Carmen and Josh, thanks so much for joining me today. And please tell us in your view, why is the topic of radiation and cardiovascular disease so important for our patients and for our community? Well, radiation therapy is received by more than half of all cancer patients and patients with cancers within the chest, so breast cancer, lung cancer, esophageal cancers, for example, they usually, they often include radiation as part of their curative treatment regimens. And so those patients that receive incidental heart radiation are at risk of radiation-induced cardiac dysfunction months to years following their therapy. Absolutely, Carmen. I think it's also important to note that radiation can really have effects on the vasculature anywhere in the body, depending on the radiation field. And this often goes unnoticed or unrecognized. Besides the effects on the heart, radiation can lead to carotid artery stenosis if you have radiation in the neck, disease of the great vessels, or aortoiliac disease with the abdominal pelvic radiation as examples. And it's crucial that clinicians understand the potential radiation effects on the heart and vasculature, how to minimize that risk, the appropriate approaches to screening, as well as the best methods for prevention and treatment. In crafting the ICOS recommendations, the expert panel really tried to focus on providing clinically useful recommendations based on the research to date that prioritized early detection and prevention for both cardiac and extracardiac vascular disease. Great, thanks so much. Really important points and really grateful for the work that you each are leading in this area. Tell me, what do you each think are, if you were to tell our audience, what are the key takeaway messages that you want our readers to take away from your, the reviews that you've both led? What are, what's key to understand about this topic? So I think something that's uh, critical to keep in mind is that despite improvements in radiation techniques over time, that radiation-induced cardiac dysfunction can occur in those who do have incidental cardiac irradiation, even if it's lower doses. And these, this, this dysfunction can include a number of abnormalities such as valvular, myocardial, or pericardial disease. And in addition, I think in that, you know, given what we're learning now and what we'll learn in the future, there are studies that are focused on the association between cardiac doses, not just to the heart in general, but to different substructures and learning how they can affect the risks and outcomes is going to be important in years to come. Those are both really good points, Carmen. I would add that the CT scans that we do for radiation planning or cancer staging provide a ready opportunity to detect asymptomatic atherosclerosis and help us direct preventive therapies. Patients are already having these CT scans for radiation planning or cancer staging, and we're able to detect coronary artery calcium or coronary artery disease on these CT scans and recognize that patients are at increased risk and should be on statin and or aspirin therapy. Historically, we relied on stress tests to look for obstructive disease, but they miss non-obstructive disease by design. And so the CT scans can help detect this non-obstructive and early disease for prevention. Additionally, consensus-based practical screening recommendations for cardiomyopathy, pericardial and vascular disease, and extracardiac CV disease based on where the radiation field is exist and are provided in the ICOS guideline. I absolutely agree with the both of you. As you know, um, as you both are collaborators, we do have ongoing studies looking at the relationships between substructure dose and cardiovascular outcomes as well as changes in cardiac imaging and biomarkers. And certainly, Josh, I agree, um, screening is critically important. And I, but I do think that there is an important need for the field for additional research to really understand who should be screened, how often, what is the true utility, what is the cost effectiveness? And so I wanted to also get your, both of your input on what do you think are the greatest needs in the field uh, as it pertains to radiation and, and cardiovascular disease? Well, as I touched on um, in, in one of those key points is I do think there is a need to learn more about what 
doses, different cardiac substructures um, can safely tolerate. And so, you know, if, if as radiation oncologists, we had this data today, we could start to alter how we plan our radiation treatments and start to limit these long-term toxicities that can occur. And this is a um, central illustration from our review. And it does show that some studies have begun to look at different substructure doses and how they correlate with either toxicity or survival. But in the future, given you know, the ability now to track these and, and to have larger studies over time, when we, you know, as we learn that this is really an important problem, I think we're going to learn more in the upcoming years that will really allow us to better tailor treatments and see lower incidence of these side effects and better know how to stratify and screen and survey these patients. Yeah, that's great, Carmen. It's very interesting research avenue, and I'm looking forward to uh, what we find as we move forward with with those research questions. I would also say that the field would benefit from two things. One is there's a dearth of information on the effects of radiation to extra cardiac structures, and we really need more research to that. But we also would benefit from dissemination and implementation science. Here we see coronary artery calcium shown on a staging CT scan. And we know that coronary artery calcium or CAC on CT increases the risk for patients receiving radiation for future cardiovascular events. That is, that is known. Yet more often than not, CAC on a radiation planning CT will go unnoticed. Similarly, CAC on a staging CT will often go unnoticed by the oncologist. In both cases, we can miss crucial opportunities to start preventive therapy, reduce morbidity, and prolong survival. And we need better systems to ensure that we're recognizing the disease that's there and starting preventive therapies. In many cases, a cardiology referral may even be helpful. Here in this image, again, we see coronary calcium on a staging CT for prostate cancer. Um, this went unnoticed, and the patient presented with unstable angina approximately a year, later, a year later, eventually undergoing a cabbage. Here, if we'd been able to start preventive therapy, it may have an impact on this person's course. There are ongoing efforts in order to use automated AI or other software to detect the coronary calcium on these planning and staging CTs, and I think making this information more readily available to the providing clinician and implementing prevention will be huge in improving our patient care. Great, great points um, by both of you, and certainly really exciting advances, particularly with the use of AI and machine learning uh, and applications to radiation oncology, which I really look forward to. Carmen, the field of radiation oncology also has made significant advances. Can you tell the audience and the readers a little bit about how the field has evolved in terms of uh, treatment planning and dose delivery of radiation therapy? Yeah, so radiation techniques and technology have greatly advanced over time, and it's schematically shown in this figure um, as far as the treatment fields and, and doses for lymphoma. Um, there's a number of techniques that have allowed us to minimize dose to the heart and to track it, such as three-dimensional radiation therapy and also deep inspiration breath hold, which allows us to essentially move the heart out of the um, way of, of radiation beams to treat the cancer. In addition, there's a number of, of newer technologies and modalities such as intensity modulated radiation therapy and proton therapy. Um, but if we think about a similar patient um, in the next slide, a uh, patient with lymphoma, how it, that patient may have been treated with traditional mantle fields shown on the left. The same patient with newer modalities would be treated much a much smaller area and the heart could get up to 10 times lower dose as shown in that, that table on the right. Certainly really exciting advances um, by the field of radiation oncology. And we all know radiation treatment 20, 30 years ago is not the same as radiation treatment today. And certainly look forward to results of trials such as RADCOMP looking at proton versus photon therapy. So thanks so much for that perspective. Um, in closing, Carmen and Josh, what do you think the clinicians need uh, to understand treatment risk? When you're seeing a patient who's been exposed or treated with thoracic radiation therapy, when you're seeing them in the clinic, what do they need to understand about the treatment plan and the dose received in order, in order for you to best estimate their cardiovascular risk and manage them? In addition, how do you think patients who received radiation therapy, how should they be followed clinically? Those are great questions, Bonnie. With regard to the treatment risk, unfortunately, many patients will not have in-depth treatment records. Um, we know that the further back the patients were radiated, especially with more traditional mantle, mantle field radiation, they're going to be at the highest risk. 
And if we don't know what the mean heart dose was, we can use the total dose as a surrogate for the potential doses received by the heart. Though even patients with newer techniques will have some risk, uh, increased risk from the radiation that they were exposed to. For more modern treatments that result in heart exposure, it's often helpful to discuss the heart doses with uh, the ra treating radiation oncologist. If that isn't possible, requesting the radiation treatment records can be helpful. And if it's difficult to discern um, the radiation treatment records, talking to a radiation oncologist at your institution to help to figure out the approximate doses to the cardiac substructures or to the heart can be helpful as well. Because even for patients with similar stage of cancer or similar locations of tumors, the doses to the heart can vary widely given a variety of factors such as patient anatomy, uh, planning techniques, or other organs that require limiting the dose. And to your other question, Bonnie, as far as how patients should be followed, it's important to realize that these patients remain at risk for the rest of their lives and may not manifest disease for years, if not decades, after their radiation. So these patients need to still be followed, and it's important to do what we can to keep them from being lost to follow-up. The ICOS recommendations, the consensus statement, will help provide useful recommendations for screening these patients in the years to come. And cardiology referrals certainly can be considered for patients at higher risk to help guide screening, prevention, or management of CV disease. Absolutely. Um, I completely agree with both of you. Uh, this speaks to the important need for collaboration of radiation oncologists, cardiologists, and the patient. We need to talk to each other to improve and advance patient care. So, and with that, I want to thank the both of you, Carmen and Josh, for your excellent work, for your leadership in the field of radiation oncology and cardio-oncology. And I will encourage all in our community to read these two important state-of-the-art reviews on radiation cardiotoxicity and JAK cardio-oncology. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks.